Yes, it's nice to uh, get back to Finland. I've been here many times, but I always go to Viramaki. And I must say it's a little bit more light here than Viramaki. <laughs> but uh, yes, I'm going to uh, also think back to where I grew up in northern Ontario in Canada. And it's very similar to Finland. We have many lakes, many trees, lots of uh, rocks, and also lots of Finnish people. <laughs> so I grew up with lots of Mackies and Peltamackies and and the guy around the corner store was Art, Art Lauti, and uh, we call him Arti Boika. So I learned the Uxi Kuxi Kalamanelli and the things like that. So that's the limit of my, my finish. But I always like to share, especially um, when it comes to Olympic Games, because I've, I've been doing them since 1984 was my first one in Los Angeles, so it's 30 years. And every time I learn something. In Sochi recently, I went with three athletes, freestyle skiers, and they all came home with medals, which was two of them were gold and one was silver. But it was, uh, I learned something there, I learned something in Vancouver, I learned something in Torino, and s some of these athletes have now retired, and so they don't mind for me to tell you what we did. For, uh, when they were competing, they didn't want to share, but now we actually do conferences together, and we talk about not only the well, I would say the mental preparation, <coughs> but I make a difference between mental and emotional. That is, the mental is the, is the thinking part, it's the talking part, it's the focusing part, visualizing, but the emotional is being able to enjoy it, being able to savor it, embrace it, control your emotions, be calm, and all those things. So I'll make that, uh, that distinction. So. But in terms of the common thing with all the athletes I've worked with, the first three Olympics I did were with the sailing team. And now, I, and then I've done some with swimming and synchronized swimming and judo and, and now more freestyle skiing, but it's always a journey. And it's a four-year journey. And that is one of the reasons that it's become so stressful and so meaningful for the athletes is they, they trained for four years and my freestyle skiers in, in Sochi they had 23 seconds or 21 seconds to come down the hill and do it right. So four years for 20 seconds is, is, is quite something. And so about what we try to do is have them not think about outcome, think about performance, how you want to, how you want to feel. So basically, when it starts out, each Olympic cycle, and to, today I'm going to talk about getting the athletes ready for the Olympics, and then tomorrow morning I'll talk more about what we do when we're actually there. But I'll kind of mix the two uh, up also. But the mission is, what are we trying to accomplish? We're trying to get on the podium, we're trying to win a gold medal. That's the objective, whether it's a team, whether it's, a, whether it's an individual athlete. And I make a distinction between the mission and the vision. The mission is what we're trying to accomplish, and the vision is how. How we're going to do it, all the steps, the process, and what it's going to feel like when you're standing on top of the hill, looking down there at these 60 moguls and these two jumps. And so that's, that's the, the vision. What's it, not just what are you going to see, but what are you going to uh, feel? And, and again, it's, it's remember when, when Jen Heil won in Torino, and uh, when I asked her after, you know, what she was saying on top of the hill. She was saying all the things that we talked about in terms of being in the moment, enjoying the moment. And then when she won, and then she signed a poster for me, which I have at home, in my office at home, and she said, she said, Wayne, I was, thank you so much. She said, I was completely ready, and my belly was smiling. And so, and to me, that, that indicates to me she got it. Completely ready means is mental. Completely ready. I know exactly what to do. But my belly, I said, you can't be up there smiling like this. But in here, you can have this smile in your belly and say, watch this. Watch. And it's not being cocky or arrogant. It's, 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 it's having that smile and say, this is what I love to do. Even with Justin uh, Dufour La Pointe, who won in Sochi, another girl I worked with. She's up there and, she, and she's saying, I love to ski, I love to compete. She said, danse avec Marlene, I'm going to 
we speak French because that's where they are. And so, but being able to have those feelings about just totally enjoying it, and not just being in the moment, but embracing the moment. So I think those are important things with that, uh, with that vision. And then it comes back to the passion. You know, loving it. And sometimes the, uh, I get questions asked, your athletes win a lot of medals, they must pay a big price. They must make a big sacrifice. And I say no, they don't. They make choices. They make an investment every day to get better. And they love what they're doing. Like the girls I'm working with now, Justin and Chloe de Fort Point, just got back from three weeks in Zermatt. Before that, they were three weeks in Australia this summer. That's where there's snow. And, but again, they're, miss they're not going to school. They're doing school by, by correspondence. It's not a sacrifice. It's a passion. They love it. And they're the best in the world, but they're trying to get better and better and better. So if this little triangle becomes very, very meaningful. And so then in terms of the, I'm just going to quickly go through the whole support team thing which we have in Canada. And we've got some really good support, a lot of financial aid right now. And sometimes these things are good, and sometimes they aren't so good. So I'll explain uh, both sides to it. But in terms of the, uh, the Canadian Olympic Committee, that's the group in, in charge of the whole operation. That is the, the, the budget and coming from the government and all those kinds of things. And they, they, they established the mission for the team. And then you have all the different national sport federations. And so they look after the, uh, the selection of the athletes and the uh, Next step is then forming an Olympic team. So it starts with the big group, with the CEO up there and the president and all the people. And then it goes to the, the federations and then down to the team. And every year, what we do with the Olympic team is we come up with themes. Come up with themes for the, uh, the team. And I'll get into that a little bit later. One of the other groups which has been more and more important since Vancouver. Vancouver, we were hosting the, uh, the Olympics. And so the government decided, through the Canadian Olympic Committee, <coughs> to form a new group called Own the Podium. And Own the Podium did some really good work, but what they did also is they came up with a lot of money, $120 million they put into the program to help the athletes have the best specialists, have the best training facilities, optimize everything they could do to get totally ready for Vancouver. So they wanted to get the most medals, and we did. We got 35, but we came second because it's, a, it's the, the country that gets the most gold medals. But again, so it was very successful. But the problem, the problem with On the Podium is when our athletes arrive in Vancouver, all they see are these big signs, On the Podium, On the Podium, On the Podium, and On the Podium is something which is in the future. And everything we're doing is to keep them in the moment. You know, so what, what I did with my athletes, instead of having them focus on own the podium, I said own the moment. Own the moment. And, and be in the moment. Be in the moment, savor that moment, enjoy that moment, but, but own that moment. It, it's, it's your moment. And so again, sometimes the own the podium you know, with all the money. And of course, the Olympics, if you win a gold medal, or if you, if you don't uh, make, make the podium, there are consequences financially, sponsors and whatnot. So we try to get the emphasis away. Put a big X here. We're not going to think podium. We're going to think, how do you want to feel? How do you want to think? How do you want to focus? All, because all of those things you can control. Okay, and so then also we have a mission team, once the Olympic team is formed, there's a mission team which goes in and they, they do the, they're already, they've already been to Korea a couple times uh, in terms of doing all the logistics, the orientation, the travel, the clothing, all of the, the, the nutritional stuff, the, the lodging, all the things that we, that are, have to be looked after and we try to have the best situation for the athletes. This group here, there's two words that I use, or two themes that, that I like to use. This group here, what they do is they clear the path. Okay, they clear the path. So in other words, the athletes, once they've made the team, 
we, we, we set up a program for the parents. We get the parents there. The par parents have Canadian clothing. The parents are looked after in terms of lodging. Like all these things are to clear the path. And what we do as sports psychologists and mental performance consultants, we try to have them have a clear mind. So I, I make that difference. You have a clear mind and then you have a clear path. You know, so there's, there's no, n no distractions. And part of that mission team is also the media. All of the interviews, for example, before Rio, which is coming up this summer, they were done last summer. Same thing with, uh, with uh, Sochi. All the, all the interviews, all the profiles which go on TV, they're all done in advance. So that clears the path. And then we have a health science team. Now we're getting smaller in terms of how I fit in. A health science team with the doctors, with the physios, with the masseurs, and all the different people and the mental performance consultants is what I do. We fit in with, with this group here. Okay, so again, we have integrated support teams, which also, in terms of the process, what they do is they look after the, uh, Those are all the sports science people, all the biomechanics people, the physiologists. We have an, a, a support team which works with the coaches and works with that athlete. And that group stays together for four years. And so what we try to do is get the best people that we can who can work together. And then we have people like myself who get to work with the athletes. I find too, more and more, and I'm not sure here in Finland if it's the same thing, but more and more the perception now is I'm going to work with a sports psychologist not because I have problems, not because I have some things that I'm troubled with. I'm going to work with a sports psychologist or a mental performance consultant because I want to learn those skills. I want to perform to my max. And so that whole perception seems to be, if I look back to 84, 30 years ago, and I look now, the athletes working with myself and my colleagues are saying, I get to work with Wayne, I get to work with him or her, and that gives me an edge. That, that helps me. That gives me an, an advantage. And so that whole thing about optimizing your performance, clearing your mind, being able to free it up, you know, and so, again, if I think back to Justine dufour le Point, and she's standing on top of the hill saying, je vais danser avec ma ligne, je vais danser avec ma ligne. You know, see, she's, she's thinking about dancing, about dancing. She's listening to Katy Perry with roar, like a tiger. You know, and so, again, these are all things, she doesn't have problems. She's having fun. But again, we're working on the emotional side. We're giving her those skills. And it's almost like they go off to the Olympics, not just with their clothing and their, and their suitcases. They've got a toolbox. They've got a toolbox. They know, how to, they know their key words. They know how to focus. They know how to breathe. They know how to stay in the moment. So these things, and again, one thing I can say, the common thing, is we have a lot of fun. They look at me and they say, wow, Wayne's calm, he's, he's smiling, and you know, so like, but we have do a lot of things. We do, in terms of this integrated support team, have challenges. I remember at uh, Vancouver, I was working with a figure skater, Joanie Rochette, and Joanie, uh, she's probably top five in the world, and uh, when her parents arrived on the Saturday night, her mother had a heart attack and died. And so we found out, they woke me up at 1.30 in the morning and told me, and I was rooming with the uh, high performance director from uh, figure skating. And uh, so they woke us up and they told us, and, uh, and you know, so we spent the whole night. And I said, well, we're not gonna wake Joanie up. And she's rooming with Tessa Virtue, who has to skate that night, and we're not gonna bother their sleep and we can't do anything. Then I had to g go out and get Manon Perron, get, find the coach who was staying with her husband. He just arrived from, from uh, Montreal. Anyway, but things that we went through with Joanie, and I can explain some of that tomorrow, in tomorrow's talk, to create a bubble around her, to have her have that clear mind. And that was a Sunday morning when we woke her up to tell her. And uh, her short program was on the Tuesday night. So 48 hours, and I'll, I'll, I'll show you the clip. There's a, Joanie and I, we did a thing on, on TV after she retired to, to talk about that, but how the support team helped her get through and what she did in terms of being able to be focused 
And one thing I can always remember in terms of giving an athlete perspective, like after she had visited the hospital and seen her, her mother's body, and we're going back to the uh, hotel or to the village, Manon Perron said to her, you don't have to make a decision today if you're going to skate. And she said, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it for my mom. Because that's what she would want. And I said right away, and I don't have training f for this. I'm not a clinical psychologist, but I, uh, my common sense said, I said, Joanie, e, you not only skate for your mom, you skate with your mom. She'll be there every step, every spin, every jump. And so at the end of every skate, she'd say, merci, mama. You know, so tomorrow I'll, I'll show you that, that little clip with, with Joni talking about some of the things that, uh, that we did. So th th those are basically the, the team behind. And so what that team, and again, I like to, when I teach my students at the university, I like to work on three C's. First one I said, think conceptually. And uh, conceptually, uh, with little models and whatnot, and uh, being able to differentiate between the past, the present, and the future. But conceptual things, but also think critically. In terms of what you read and what you hear, you don't just accept it. Study it, analyze it. And then the final is think creatively. And this, this to me is a bit of creativity. I, I came up with it because I work a lot with our hockey teams too. And in terms of getting guys to work together, and people say there's no I in team. There's no letter I in team. And I, and I totally disagree. I said there's a lot of I's in the team. And our, our support team, our integrated support team, our, our mission team, our, our, our Olympic team, we're a team. And there's a lot of I's there. But if these people are going to work together, they, they can form a team. You know, so if you take two I's, one I working with another, it becomes a T. Then you take another I, this could be a doctor, and then you give them three masseurs or other, other people working, you get a knee. You know, so the, all these I's, and it helps people to kind of bury their egos. Put your ego in your, in your back pocket. So again, you take two more I's. Sometimes we do this with teams who, in the team building, I think we do it in the snow, and they, they lie in the snow, and then they, we take pictures from up above and stuff. But, but again, now hey, if you've got a little short person on your team, you put them right there. You put them right there, the, the little wee ones, the little short, short guys or girls. And then, of course, you've got two. See, there's two more eyes. What do those eyes do? They work with two others. Or they work with some flexible person now, and they, and they make, an, make a name. So again, that's just a concept which I did a, a presentation to our Olympic team before London. We brought together all of the support team, all of the doctors, all of the travel people, all the media people, and, and we talked about how can we create the best environment. And so the title of my presentation was Clear the Path. Clear the Path. How can we clear the path? And this is one of the things we talked about. Being able to clear the path and everybody working together. Working together. When they come into the sports medicine clinic, when they meet people, we're smiling, we're positive, we're professional, and we're always in the background. Always in the background, the athletes are, are out front. Okay, just to give you an example. Here's, here's a gal I did, uh, Torino and uh, Vancouver, with uh, Jen Heil. She's a freestyle uh, skier. And we had our, our little team all, all around her. So she had her personal trainer, Scott Livingston. He did her, her physical training. And they personalized, like she did Salt Lake too. And she came fourth in Salt Lake as an 18-year-old. And so then she came to Montreal to go to university, to McGill. And this team was formed. And so she had a personal trainer. She had her ski coach who did the technical. This, this person did the physical, this person did the, the technical. And then there was an exercise physiologist who did all of the cardio stuff and all that, that sort of thing. And then we had the athletic therapist who also was an osteopath, which turned out to be really, really important. Because Jen, I remember when I got to Torino, she was having, she was having some trouble with her, one of her glutes, and she was having trouble with her range of motion, and, uh, and Dave and I went over, Dave Campbell, the osteopath, and he, and, he, and he worked on her there, 
And, it, and, and the physios had been working right here on her glute. Turned out it was something up in her shoulder. He loosened her up. All of a sudden, oof, now I'm ready to go. You know, so again, this team worked very, very closely. Then it was me, the sports psych guy. Then she had an agent who brought us all together and uh, looked after all of her stuff if she has to do stuff with the media and all the rest, and then nutrition. So these would be some of the, some of the people who would be working together very, very closely with, uh, with this uh, athlete. Again, you know, to make things visual and concrete and to be a little bit creative, I've, I've formed this confidence table. You know, and then part of the process, getting the athlete ready for the Olympics so they can say, I'm completely ready. I know I'm ready. We start with this confidence table. And what I did was I've, I formed a confidence table with four legs on it. And some of those people you saw in the previous slide, you know, you had a person here looking after her fitness. You got the fitness being looked after. You got the technical stuff being looked after. And then you got the tactical. Tactical in a team sport, offensive, de defensive. But tactical in some sports is how you're going to approach things, whether you're in terms of a build-up, all those things. But you know what? These three legs, it's been my experience, these three legs can be really, really strong. The athlete gets to the Olympics. If this leg here is a little bit thin, or it's a little bit short, and then the pressure and the expectations to do well in that 23 seconds. If that pressure is pushing on that table, the table is going to come down because this leg is not strong enough. So what we do is we work with the athletes and then we give them skills. How to, how to talk to yourself. Going to training, it's, for example, instead of saying, I've got to go to training or I have to go to training, and then being on the creative side, I take the word, I've got to. I, I change the letter O to an E, and it becomes, I get to. You know, it's a small, small li little things. Or if there's, instead of saying before a competition, I hope I have a, a good run. I hope I have a good day on the hill. I hope I don't mess up. Or I've got to have a good day. Or I'd better, or I have to. What we do is we make them aware of the way they're talking to themselves. So the I have to, I'd better, I've got to, I hope, we get rid of them. And we replace them with I know. And tomorrow you'll hear Joanie Rochette talking about her I know list, how we put together. And I started using that in 2006 with Jen Heil doing an I know list with 10 things like I know I'm fit, I know I'm healthy, I know I've had great training, I know we've got a great support team. I know my key words. I know, I know, I know, I know. And when she won, she came down. She had a great run, and she won. And after the media stuff, I saw her, and I said, did you use your I know list on top of the hill? She, she went in her pocket like this. She reached in her pocket, pulled it out. She says, Wayne, it was in my pocket. And then Justine and Chloe at, uh, in, in Sochi, same kind of thing, I know list. And when we hugged after they won their medals, in their pocket and their teeth, they got their I know list. Because that stuff's not bullshit, it's facts. You know, and so you arm the athlete with these facts, and those facts, what they're gonna do, they're gonna make this mental leg really strong. And on the back side of the mental leg is the emotional part, which is equally as important. So these, again, you know, when athletes come to see me at the university, they all want to talk about confidence. But I've also added another word here, which I don't have on this slide, but it's consistency. Being consistent. Not just being confident. Being cons this is like bringing your A game. Being consistent. Bring it all the time. Bring it all the time. Okay, so, our mission. Okay, in terms of that whole support team I just talked about, everybody's work to help our athletes or to provide an athlete, gives them a clear mind and a clear path. Okay, so like, in other words, sometimes w athletes worry about their parents. It's a distraction. Do they have tickets? Is everything okay? Or, or sometimes they're worried about other things which they, they can't control, but what we do, we try to clear it. As we don't need any trees falling out and follow them in front of them along, along the way. 
to bring their best. And that's a, a little concept which uh, I really like to use. And I've got a quote in there somewhere from uh, our uh, chef de mission, Steve, Steve Podborski. He's a former skier. He was a, he'd done many world championships and he was our chef de mission. When he addressed the team in Vancouver, I think it was about a few months before or so, she, I think it was in December actually, and he said, when you go to the Olympics, what you want to do is be the best you are. You know, so bring your best. You're already good. Let that come out. And that's what I find is, is the challenge. Building the athlete up so they can get there and they can free it up. <laughs> they can be totally confident and they feel, feel they're not like this, they're not tight and like this. So again, be, your, be the best you are or bring your best. Okay, the Olympic mindset. Well, that, that's the one I just mentioned now. Be the best you are. You're already good. I remember sitting beside one of my athletes when, when Steve said that. And I said, I wrote it out. I said, just in. I said, that's exactly what, the way you want to feel. You're already good. What you want to do? Look down that hill and say, here we go. Watch this. You know, so again, these are pretty basic fundamental things. But if you have a structure, and you have a model like a confidence table. And I think it was Leonardo da Vinci said the language of images is more important than the language than words. So I use a lot of images. I use a lot of circles. I, I use a lot of triangles. I use the, the table is an, is, an, is an image. So I hope that you can, when you're looking at this, this whole thing, you're saying, okay, how can I have my athlete think about Think about these things in a visual, visual, concrete way. And as I say, that was just before 14. Okay, so as we, uh, we move on here, and I'm going to show you a couple of uh, clips in terms of what we do. Key concepts, clear mind, clear path. That's, th that's the first big one. Next one is control the controllables. Again, I like to use uh, acronyms, or I like to make things sticky. So I use, uh, I, I, sometimes I take the first letter, C, T, C. And sometimes, I'm where I remember way back working with the sailors, they would put C, T, C on their boats, the three letter C, T, C. Because in sailing, you can't control the wind, you can't control the waves, you can't control a, a whole bunch of things, but you can control many things. So we do that with every athlete. What can I control and what can't you control? In Sochi, for example, we knew going in, we knew that the finals in freestyle skiing were going to be at 11.30 at night for television back home. Usually, qualifications in freestyle skiing is at 1 o'clock, the finals are around 3 o'clock, or they're at 11 o'clock, 3 o'clock, whatever. Usually, they're just a few hours apart in the daytime. Once in a while, you get it afternoon, like in Deer Valley in the States, and then finals at night. But you don't get it near midnight. But that's something we knew. But you can't control it. So we trained. They trained in the evening. You know, we, we trained that. What do you do between qualies and finals and semifinals? We had a plan, you know, in, in terms of that. So you take all the things that you can't control, and you make a list of them, and then you say, what can I control? The way I think. The way I focus the way I breathe, my body language. Am I walking around like this, or am I walking like this? Here we go. And again, I remember with Joni Rochette, the key words we came up with were, stand tall. She's only five foot two. On figure skate, she's five foot five. But, but when she would come out of the dressing room, she wouldn't be coming out like this, she'd be like this. And she'd get on the ice, and the music would start. She'd take a deep breath. So she had no tension in her body, but, but all, it was all about standing tall, standing tall. Even with my, my skiers, we talk about it in terms of the upper body, in terms of being, projecting this, 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 this confidence and having, having the shoulders back, chest out, you know, stuff like that. Like, and one of the, it's funny when you work in two languages, like I'm English, but I teach in French at the University of Montreal. I learned my French in uh, Switzerland when I played uh, professional hockey, so I'm lucky that I can work with in two languages. But in terms of working with the skiers, we talk about not just having a, 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 a proud chest, but a chest fier, 
like this, and shoulder, shoulders, uh, shoulders back. So again, you want to focus on things, body language, yep, under control, check. Breathing, under control, keywords, check, boom. So the other thing is, how do you deal with the pressure? And one of the things that I've learned from one of the hockey coaches I work with, he said, don't feel the pressure. Don't get tight and feel the pressure and s squeeze your stick or not. Apply the pressure. Apply the pressure. Like in basketball, they talk about full court press. What do you do? You, you, you go after the person, you put pressure on them, take away their time, take away their space. So we do the same thing. Like with my skiers, we say, you're going to go faster, or you're going to go higher. See if they can catch me. One of the Alpine skiers on our Alpine ski team, she's got it on the, on the back of her helmet, catch, catch me if you can. Catch me if you can. You know, in other words, I, I'm, I'm going fast. You know, I'm going to, so again, these are pretty basic concepts. But it also, here's another image, which again is kind of a, a simple little uh, image, but it's, it's the doctoral training, if you had it. What I had was training in, in interactionists. What it means is all the, all the athletes I work with, they're different. But they're all people, they have personalities, they have motives, they have, they have different ways of approaching things. So you look at each person individually. All the sports I've mentioned, from sailing, through judo, through f figure skating, now I'm working with a couple of speed skaters, there's a task. And that task has demands. You know, so when the skiers are coming down the hill, they gotta be really, really intense and attack the moguls, boom, 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 boom. And then they gotta go off a jump, Float like that in the air, land, boom, tight, direct, boom, 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 relax again. But again, what you do is you get to know, as a sports psychologist, what are the task demands? How can I help the person? And then you get to know what's the situation. Situation, as I, men I mentioned, in Sochi was the finals are going to be at 11.30 at night. That's a situational factor. We were in, in Sochi in 2013 for a pre-Olympic uh, event, competition. It was 15 degrees Celsius on the hill, 15. The skiers are coming down in t-shirts and slush, heavy, heavy slush. They're landing their, their, their jumps and their skis are going in the snow and they're falling and they're rolling. So what we did, we went and trained on that. We went and found that snow in the summertime. And they trained, they simulated it. But also they skied on ice, they skied in wind, they skied in rain. In, in Vancouver, it was foggy, it was raining, but we, we skied in it. So all these situational things. So again, it's kind of a conceptual way of looking, not just at the person, not just at what they're doing, but all the things, even the, the family situation, all the, there's many things to be looked at. Okay, again, what can you control? There's your CTC. Your thoughts. What are you saying to yourself? I've got to, I hope, I better, all that kind of stuff. Do you have your key words? That's all, like psychologists call that the cognitive part. I remember when I heard that, uh, that word when I was doing my masters, the cognitive. I said, as athletes, we don't know what cognitions are. <laughs> Coaches don't know what cognitions are. They know what thoughts are. They know what feelings are. It's the same thing. So here, focus. Being in the moment, being totally engaged, learning to be in the moment. That, that's a, a thing that you can control. It's, it's getting into your bubble, getting into your zone, so you block everything, everything out. It's a controllable. Making good decisions, making good choices. You know, in terms of going to, uh, going to training, being proactive, what am I gonna work on today? You know, making those choices, eating well, hydrating well, sleeping well, all those things, that they, they're choices. And, th and that's why this word here, when they, they ask me about my athletes, do they make a sacrifice? Do they pay a price and all that? I said, no, they make good decisions. I have a, uh, I don't have the slide here with me, but sometimes they use what I call the, uh, the four Ds. The four Ds, daily decisions, determine destiny. Daily, my friend Peter Jensen, he does a lot of, he works with our teams too. He does a lot of uh, 
motivational corporate speaking, and he says, Wayne, I use the four Ds all the time. I, st I steal that from you, the four Ds. Daily decisions determine destiny. In other words, what you do every day, the choices you make, being proactive, and not always just being reactive, being proactive, looking ahead, what can I do? Like with my two skiers right now, Justin and Chloe, what they're trying to do, they're already the best in the world. They're first and second in the world. They're trying to create a gap. They want to keep getting better and better. They want to ski like guys. They want to be able to go faster. They want to go higher. So again, they're being proactive. They're not looking back and saying, who's trying to catch us? We're going ahead. Okay, and again, emotions. Enjoying the moment. Savoring the moment. Embracing the moment. Being calm. Being composed. Those are things emotional control, emotional management. <laughs> Psychologists call it self-management. Managing. Managing these things. Your thoughts, your focus, your all these things. And again, your work ethic. Work ethic. It's something that can be controlled. I love there's a good book. It's called Raising a Team Player. Raising a Team Player by Tim, Tim Sheehy. But in that book, he talks about building teams. And he said, it, the first chapter is called work ethic. The last chapter is called humility. And, and, but, he, but in terms of work ethic, he says, work ethic is a skill. It is a skill. And you can't control it. So if every day you bring quality, and you bring purpose, and you bring, you bring focus to your training, you're going to get that edge. And this is where we help the athletes setting goals. Don't just set goals about outcome. Set daily goals. Daily goals in, in practice. And then body language. The positive, the confident, all that sort of thing. You know, again, the athlete can control it. You know, so when, once you start to equip them with these things, you say, wow, I can't control this, I can't control that, what the media is saying, what the weather is going to be, but I can control all these things. And I'm going to totally, totally enjoy this. Energy. And again, thinking conceptually. People always talk about physical energy. But I know for co athletes and coaches, the mental energy, being sharp, being alert, being there, being engaged. The emotional energy, and enjoying something, not feeling like this, getting run, run down. But again, that's another thing that can be controlled. You know, so again, these are things which, again, we feel, and again, I, I come back to this use of things. Again, people say, you know, when you work with athletes, what do you do? And I say, I try to give them tools which are simple, which are tangible, concrete, but sticky, that are really, really sticky. And hopefully some of these things are, are sticking. Okay, again, going to the creative side a little bit and the conceptual side. You know, in terms of the Olympics, if you go into the Olympics, summer Olympics are different than, than winter. I find summer are so big. I mean, you've got 12,000 athletes, you've got all these people there. The winter, it's almost like they're, they're intimate, if you will. I remember being in Sochi, we had athletes in the main village. We were halfway up the mountain, then the aerobic people were way up top of the mountain. But again, there's climate control, which we, which we talk about in a way. So I, I make a distinction between the external climate, what's going on with the weather, but what's going on inside you? Your internal climate. Okay, are you focused? Are you calm? Are you composed? Are you, all these things here. Are you excited? Excited about going to it? Or are you afraid? You don't, you, so again, we say, you can't do anything about the external climate you know, in terms of the weather. We can, in terms of our support team, what, when they go into the sports medicine clinic, the doctors that are working there, the, the uh, other support team, the exercise physiologists, the masseurs, all these people, they're part of the external climate. So what we do, we work on. We work on, on things physically, socially, emotionally, with the support team. And what we started doing, I think it was in, might have been in Torino with the Winter Olympics. Like within our, like we usually, we have a big Olympic team. We have a lot of athletes, so we usually get a building. So within our building, we set up a wellness center. 
And that's one of our doctors suggested. It's a wellness center. So it's a place the athletes can go at night. And there's quiet music. And they can go in, they can do their meditation, their yoga. There's candles in there. And they can just <sighs> decompress. You know, so again, that's something physically. Socially, we work hard on, on preparing our support staff to act in the right way, to be in the right way, to look after their own needs at the Olympics. And then you got the emotional, the whole team enjoying it. So in other words, we try to come up with a team identity. So we see as a support team. When the athletes see us, what do they see? What do they feel? And then what do they say? You know what say? They say, wow, looks like everybody here is really, in, they're excited to be here, they're, they're enjoying it. But it, sometimes you get into a little conflict, somebody doesn't want to work a shift here, they want to go see an event there. So we try to look after those things in advance. So just to, when I spoke to the entire Olympic team, I came up with this, this concept, you know, of, of the internal and external climate. But I said, you know, when you go to the Olympics, because of all the money the government's put in on the podium, there's pressure. And, and that pressure, it can make the thermometer go higher and higher and higher so people start to get stressed and whatnot. I said, no. Instead of looking at it as a thermometer, look at the whole situation as a thermostat. So a thermostat here, if I, I want to have the temperature at 60, whatever it is, 25 degrees, 23 degrees, I go and I push it. I push a button. So I think this, is a, this concept here gives control. Instead of everybody getting uptight, athletes, coaches, support staff, think of you like a thermostat. And now you're in control. You're calm. You're composed. Okay, this is another thing here. Just before uh, I give you a couple of little clips here. Making the athletes or helping the athletes to be accountable. Okay, be accountable and not point fingers at other things, not make excuses. No excuses, no regrets. And these are things that they're, they're things which we, we talk a lot about. In other words, some of the things can go wrong on the way. You know, in terms of there could be bus breakdowns. I remember in Vancouver, with, I was working with, again, some skiers, and Jen Heil was one of them. And uh, two days in a row, two days in a row, her bus broke down going up to the ski hill, up to Cyprus. You know, and, and in terms of what we said, okay, like we all said, okay, what are we going to do? So we were able, because we were hosting the Olympics, we were able to get pri private transportation, and we got her up there. So I would go up with her coach. We just stayed totally in the, in the solution. But I find, and again, I learned this from a coach. He said, anytime athletes are making excuses, you know, for whatever it is, it could be a hockey player not being on the power play, it could be uh, some other teams doing certain things which we're not doing. He said, instead of pointing fingers, this guy said, every time you point a finger, at something, organizing committee, weather, all that. He said, look at how many f fingers are pointing back at you. Three. So what I've done, I gave them names. I said, I gave them your names. Instead of that one, <laughs> instead of looking at the excuses, what can I control? Number one, how hard am I working? What am I doing every day to get better? Number two, execution. With my skiers, it's how well they're going through the moguls, how well they're jumping. If it's a hockey player, how am I putting pucks on the tape? How am I moving my feet? Like all these kinds of things. And then probably the most important is the emotion, bringing emotion. So again, if you can point out to an athlete, you work the, they say, you're making a lot of excuses. How many fingers are pointing back at you? What are you doing about these, these three uh, here? And I find that uh, it, make, it becomes very, uh, very uh, effective. Okay, just to uh, kind of sum up here. This was a, like a theme going into Vancouver. Own the podium. A new le podium. That's what our athletes heard about. That's what they saw everywhere. So I said to, to my athletes I was working with, I said, are you going to focus on, on results, outcome, and future? Okay, which is owning the podium, which is what the government and everybody wants you to hear. Or are you going to own the moment? Totally different perspective. Totally different way of looking at it. If you own the moment, that means you go out, you perform, you execute, 
You're in control and you're totally, totally in the present, totally in the moment. So again, you know, like getting away from this own the podium because the podium is in the future. Own the moment. Like here's Alex Bilodeau. Uh, that was his second Olympics. I was with him in uh, Sochi. As an 18-year-old, he finished 11th. He just made the team late, so we didn't get a chance to work much on the mental stuff. And he was skiing really well, but in, it was his first Olympics in, in, in uh, T Torino, and he came 11th. Going to Vancouver, he was number one in the world. He was expected to win, and, and he did. And then when we went into Sochi, everybody was saying, Will Alex defend his gold medal? Will Alex be able to repeat? I said, Alex, they don't exist. They don't exist. You don't repeat, you don't defend. You keep getting better. You go out and you perform. And so that, but when we were in, uh, in Vancouver, I mean, there were big s pictures of him on, on the walls of buildings and stuff. And so when we went through our, our, our triangle, we kept talking about the triangle. We said, okay, in term, and Alex was the one that pointed this out. He said, Wayne, you talk about the physical all the time being the foundation. He said, you know, you should look at it. We should put the fitness over here. That's all the stuff he says I do with Scotty, Scott Livingston. That's all my, my, my strength, my cardio, my, my, all that. But he said, and here's the stuff I do with, uh, with Dom, my coach. Or maybe it was Michelle Amelai going into uh, Sochi. So these are, this is the whole technical package. This is the whole fitness package, but those things don't come out. They don't come out unless the athlete has the mental skills and they also have the emotional. Like, look, at this is downtown. Downtown Vancouver. Here's a bus. Here's a car. Look at the size of the car and the people. Look at the size of Alex. We're walking downtown and people are saying, just enjoy it, enjoy it. And you got on the podium, you got his picture on the wall. So what we did, and again, something you couldn't control, there was no snow. They had to bring it in by helicopter. They had to bring it in by, by, by truck. And they had to make, make the hill. But this is the task that he had, and Jennifer had, come down that hill in the fastest time, despite the fact there was rain and stuff. And again, here's all the, the crowd, all the expectations, people expecting Alex to win a gold medal. And what happened was, he did. He won a gold medal, okay? But in terms of the way that he was, one of the parts of, of him being able to it was he knew, he knew exactly how, how he wanted to think. And I like this little quote here. You know, what he said after he, after he won his medal. And it goes with the preparation. On top, I had no regrets. No regrets. On what I've done in the last four years, I said, I'm ready. Now that's mental. The most ready I've ever been, so let's just let it happen, let it go. There's nothing more I can do. What will happen will happen. I went out, I knew what to do. My key words were in my head. So when I read that, I said, that's a pretty good way to think. And we went through a lot of things to help him to be able to think, think like that. You know, so. Here was us, somebody took a picture of Alex and me. I think it was Joe and E took the picture. We, this is the morning of his race, Sunday morning. Jennifer Heil went Saturday night, and she, she skied better than she did in Torino, where she won a gold. The girl from the States, Hannah Kearney, skied better, beat her. She came second. Now Alex has a chance the next day to make history, to be the first Canadian athlete to ever win a gold medal when we're hosting. So he called me up at, at the ski hill after he saw Jen's run, and he said, uh, can we get together in the morning? I said, sure, we're in the cafeteria. Here we are, and the reason his thumb is up, and I'll finish in two minutes, exactly. <laughs> it's, it's called being in the moment, being, being connected. And, uh, but the reason he's laughing is that we, we came, I, I said to him, what are you go what's the last thing you're going to say to yourself when you're on top of the hill? He said, no regrets, just go. No regrets, just go. So I said, Alex, I said, I like the no regrets. Well, first of all, I had him explain to me. I said, it's a little bit negative. He said, Wayne, I've done everything possible. You know the confidence table? 
physically, tactically, technically, mentally, I'm totally ready. I have no regrets. Just go. I said, you've got, you've got the mental down, no regrets, that's what you're saying to yourself. And you've got the, the physical down, just go. I said, we need something for the emotional side. So he kind of closed his eyes, and he's looking up like that. He says, I know what I'll say. He said, I'll say to myself, no regrets, fuck it, just go. <laughs> But when, when, he's a, but when he came out with those, the, those two words, needs a French guy speaking English, fuck it, just go. But what that does, that, that just frees him up. Fuck it, just, and so, but he wouldn't tell anybody when he did his interviews what, what he was thinking. But when he won in Sochi, he won again. And uh, he said, it's kind of bad language, but what I said to myself is, boom, boom, fuck it, just go. But again, that was him freeing up. Okay, so what I'll do here, well, here, this is what he signed on the poster he, he gave me after, after the Olympics. Thanks for all your good work and efforts. We did it. Fuck it. Just go. You know, so, so again, it's a, I mean, you, they don't teach you this in, uh, in grad school. This is him in, uh, in Sochi. I'll, I'll just show you him uh, coming down the hill in um, Vancouver so you get an idea. See, right here, that's the first one. I'll tell you about the emotional side in a little bit. He has a brother who has cerebral palsy. Big, big motivational part. You have no idea how fast they're going. It's faster when you're standing there. There's his brother. His brother's in a wheelchair. Cerebral Paul, he stands up. And so Alex applied. Here's the next guy, the last guy to go. This guy's feeling pressure from France. He missed that bottom jump. He's supposed to grab the ski and he, he totally missed it. He was going so fast. But she tries to console him here. <laughs> this guy he ended up finishing fourth, didn't even get a medal. Okay, Sarah, thanks for your patience. <laughs> <laughs> Not only is Sarah a good, good ho hostess, she picked me up at the airport, but she's really good in terms of organizing everything, but, uh, and Kiera's probably pretty patient, saying, is he ever going to finish up there? You know, when I teach at the university, our classes are all three hours long, and so when you, when you teach, first hours, you go an hour and a half, then a break, and you know, all of a sudden you start teaching, holy jumping, it's an hour and a half's gone by. So. I, I used 15 minutes from the director, I guess. And okay. <laughs> but tomorrow what I'm going to do, I'm going to go more into detail in terms of what we actually do on site. You know, in terms of like, I can talk specifically, show you the clip from Joanie and what, what she did and how she was thinking, ha handling that uh, tragedy in her life. <laughs> also going into uh, Sochi with Alex, all the pressure to defend or repeat, which he didn't do. He didn't think those things. He went and he totally, totally nailed it. But I hope, hopefully some of these things will, uh, will stick and then uh, we'll, we'll pass it on to uh, Kara. So thank you very much. Yeah.